I think we might start. Um, it's time and we're all here and thank you all for coming and joining us for this session at the BAD Sydney Crime Writers Festival 2023 and this session where Karen Robinson Isles, Kirsten Gray and Tony Birch are going to help us explore the proposition of whose law and who is it for. I'm Larissa Berendt, I'm a Uwalari Gamilaroi woman, um, I'm a lawyer, researcher, um, filmmaker and broadcaster. Um, I host a show on the ABC called Speaking Out and we are recording today's session for it. So if there's something that you didn't hear properly, you'll be able to catch it up when we play it again. So I'd like to just start by acknowledging that we're meeting on Gadigal country and I'd like to acknowledge the grace with which they share this beautiful land and sea with us and the way that they have kept law and storytelling strong on this country for us. A little bit of housekeeping, please mute your phones. Um, and if you do want to share on social media, it's at Bad Crime Sydney or hashtag Bad Crime Sydney. And uh, there are people online, I understand. And if you are online and have a question, please put them in the chat. So I'm going to introduce each of our speakers first and then we'll get into a conversation. And it's a great panel for this, um, for, for this topic. We've got two really impressive First Nations lawyers and one of our leading First Nations writers to help us deconstruct this topic. So Karen Robinson Isles is the founder and principal of Violet Company Legal and Consulting. She spent years in corporate social responsibility and pro bono roles um, and has done a, a large amount of work for First Nations people actually. Um, came to know Karen through um, my legal work and the um, large amount of work she does pro bono for First Nations people facing discrimination. Um, and she is an amazing advocate. And we're going to hear a little bit more about one of the really important campaigns that she's been running. Kirsten Gray is a Marawari Uwalari woman um, from Northwest New South Wales. Um, and those of you who are astute would notice that Kirsten and I are from the same nation, little nation that punches above its weight. Um, Kirsten's done an amazing amount of work in the child protection area um, and advocating for the rights of our people through that area. But also she's worked on two Royal Commissions of note, the Northern Territory Royal Commission into the Protection and Detention of Children that uh, started after the footage at Dondale became public. But she's also recently been working on the Royal Commission into Disability. She's currently a PhD student, but she is actually also a very um, highly regarded researcher as well, and she's at Jambana. <coughs> Tony Birch is um, a Fitzroy Black. He's an historian who um, I think first became known in the First Nations community for his really important interventions around um, putting Indigenous perspectives into the narratives around history and particularly during the beginning of the Howard eras. But since then, he's come, come along to be one of our most distinguished First Nations writers. Um, he's written four novels, five short story fiction collections, two books of poetry. Um, his book from last year, a collection of short stories, um, Dark as Last Night, was awarded the Christina Stead Literary Prize and the Steel Rudd Literary Award and I highly recommend it. Tony's really accomplished in every form that he writes but that is one of his most exceptional books. Um, and his most recent book we were talking about today, Women and Children, also fantastic um, story that we will delve into a little bit more. So welcome to our panellists. And I'm going to start by asking each of you really about the proposition that we're here to discuss, which is whose law and who is it for, since each of you would come to that with your very own personal and cultural perspectives on that. And we might start with you, Tony. Um, thank you very much, Larissa, and, and thank you for fellow panellists. Um, very, a great privilege to, to be here. I suppose immediately that um, I talked about this a little bit recently and, and written about it. I suppose for me it's the enormous gap or the contrast and contradiction 
between some of the so-called treaty discussions that are going on around Australia and particularly it's seemingly advanced in Victoria but we know that there's a treaty reference group in Queensland for etc there's a, a notional voice to parliament discussion in South Australia and while not wanting to s criticize those initiatives I'm just continually struck by say in the Victorian situation which I know is mirrored across the country that we have a government that is sitting down with the People's Assembly, the Aboriginal um, Assembly and the, and the commissioners, the Europe commissioners, to discuss a um, statewide treaty, which in some ways, you know, is a recognition of law, but how much of a recognition it is is, is debatable. But the fact is I find there's, for me, a, a deep um, problematic contradiction that in many states of Australia where people are discussing Aboriginal law and the potential of its legitimacy, at the same time that there is horrific violence, state violence occurring, particularly against, but not only um, young Aboriginal people. So when we all saw the shocking um, footage of the um, terrible torture of, of young people at Dundal in Queensland, and we had the Royal Commission, we would have expected there would be some valuable outcomes for, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And yet, as an example, say Queensland, where they have a, a, an advisory body to talk about treaty, we know that um, children as young as 10 are still being locked up in adult prisons. So personally, and I've, I've spoken about this with, with friends of mine in Melbourne and some of us are, personally, I find it incomprehensible in some ways that politicians talk about recognising our rights while openly abusing the rights of children at the same time and, and in some cases wantonly slow. So the law and order campaigns that are run by particular politicians of various political makeup, both Labor and Conservative across Australia, is that when they talk about why they need to lock up children, they are quite open about the need to punish these children. So I couldn't imagine sitting down at a table with those people to negotiate a treaty and philosophically, and I know this isn't, um, not a widely held view, I always consider that if you want to negotiate a treaty, it's got to be between two people of equal moral worth or two groups who come with equal value of each other. And I don't see that these politicians, that they don't deserve our conversation, I don't think. Now, clearly I'm not involved in the process and wouldn't be, but I find it, I find it deeply problematic. Thank you, Tony. Kirsten? Yeah, thanks, Tony, and thanks, Larissa, for having me here today. Um, well, I think looking, reflecting on that question, um, whose law we have inherited, you know, a British legal system um, that was imported uh, into this country, um, and so by and large, the experiences of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is an experience of, of that legal system, um, whether it's through you know the criminal justice system, the care and protection system, all the systems. Um, and it has a pretty devastating effect on, on our communities. Um, and as, as Tony's reflected, you know, we do have a number of processes, which I think are important acknowledgements of um, trying to, of systems trying to work and acknowledge, work with and acknowledge First Nations peoples. There are contradictions in those, in the way that the Australian government and the state governments and territory governments um, engage with us in those processes. That there may be an implicit acknowledgement of First Nations sovereignty in those processes, but having been involved at least in the Queensland process, we can see very clearly post the referendum that there's been a shift in the way that those conversations have been happening, which were once bi bipartisan and are now very shaky. Um, and they were considered to be quite strong. Um, the, the comprehensive consultation processes, the way that the the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community kind of um, endorsed and wrapped themselves around that process initially um, has now somewhat shifted. Um, there had been talk about tr truth-telling um, as well as treaty. Um, I, I don't know the extent to which any of the modern uh, First Nations treaty processes are going to actually acknowledge our, our laws and our ways of being that have always been here and which continue to be practised even though you may not recognise them. Um, with your own eyes, they're still there. I don't know the extent to which those processes acknowledge that. Um, but for me, particularly sitting uh, in a post-referendum line, 
I don't really think I can sit here and say that the law is one that's for us. I mean, the Australian Constitution, and it's not really a discussion we had with the referendum itself, um, is inherently racist. It has provisions in there around the race power, for example, which has only ever been exercised to the detriment of First Nations people, um, which is a conversation we didn't really have around the referendum discussion. Um, and so I just think the devastating impact that those systems have on us, particularly in my experience in a child protection sense, um, in the overwhelming and devastating impact that has on our families. We, we have kind of throwaway discussions about, oh, the overrepresentation, what are we doing about it? But actually we continue to do the same things. We have a little bit of tinkering with um, policy reform and legislative reform, but um, by and large, we're still being impacted by a very, very violent system. Thank you. And Karen? I think for me, um, my mind goes back to the, the very first years of um, invasion and colonisation. I'm a descendant of the Darug Aboriginal people along Jerubbin, the Hawkesbury River, but also a descendant of the white um, British uh, settlers. They would, my, you know, fa ancient family members would probably call themselves. And so when I think about whose law, I think back to those times. And if you've read um, the book Secret River, um, if you've watched Rachel, Rachel Perkins' excellent three-part documentary series, The Australia Wars, um, or People of the River, which is a, a more um, historical look at that region, the, the war, the resistance and the application of laws in those very first years of the colony, I think, remain completely unchanged in this, in this country. We have had a system of English law imposed on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people throughout this country to their detriment. And that, that legal system has never protected my ancestors from um, what I would term genocide. It's never protected against the removal, force, forcible removal of children from community. It's never protected um, against the rape and sexual assault and forced domestic servitude of Aboriginal women either, let alone the, the murders of, of so many of, of um, Aboriginal people around the country. So for me, I think that there, there really is um, that fundamental injustice. And if you look at the policing these days, and we can get into it a, a, a little later, but if you look at policing and the way policing happened in those very first, you know, days, months, weeks and years of the colony, I really don't think anything has particularly changed and I'm happy to, to talk more about that. That's a great segue because I think <clears throat> particularly what we'll draw out in the discussion going forward with all three of you is the fact that um, we'll be looking at the contemporary issues so it's um, a really important background if people think that that's just a thing of the past. And I will start with you, Karen. Um, why don't we start with why you decided to study law? Well, um, for me, I have a fabulous auntie, Auntie Meg or Margaret, um, and she um, is, she actually studied um, two degrees at Macquarie University. And for me, I had a, grew up with an incredible role model of an auntie. And my grandmother lived near Macquarie University, so we would often, um, you know, go to the grounds of Macquarie Uni on a weekend on our way to, you know, the, sh the local shopping centre. And so for me, I grew up around having a fabulous role model who had, through her education, travelled the world and worked in education um, and and then also just being exposed um, to the university was, was really important. For me, the other main influence is my mother. She worked at Gosford Local Court. So I used to grab a lift home with her after school. And so I'd have to hang around a bit. And so I'd sit up the back of the district court and listen to the proceedings. 
Um, so it was my very own live Judge Judy, really. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and and then my dad, he's got a you know, and, and mum, but an incredible sense of compassion and social justice. At the same time, in my teenage years, um, the um, Jabaluka uranium mine was going ahead and the rights and, and wishes of um, the local Aboriginal people were just not being heard. It was um, also um, the French nuclear testing in the Pacific. It was um, John Howard being elected on the same day as Mardi Gras. I was with my parents at Mardi Gras and we were walking back home, you know, back to the train station through Hyde Park and just everyone going, oh my gosh, what has just happened? <laughs> and from there, it was the rise of Pauline Hanson um, and the, the attempts to overturn Mabo and, and Wick and things like that. So these incredible um, injustices, I think, that you could see ar around um, as well as the influences of those three key family members for me made, um, made law a pretty natural choice for me. If you want to change something, then, you know, get in there and, and get stuck into the law. I do want to talk about the really important campaigning law reform work that you're doing. But just before then, I did just want to ask you, because I think it's important to also touch upon the fact that as a lawyer, day to day, you are working on cases where there, you are dealing with um, structural racism. Um, as an employment lawyer, obviously that's a big part of the work that you do. So I wonder if you could just um, maybe give us a little bit of a snapshot of the sorts of issues you're seeing in your work. Certainly um, that intersection of um, discrimination is, is really common. Um, I think, you know, as, as women, we're not just just women. We might be a woman with a disability, a um, trans woman, a um, Aboriginal woman, a woman from a refugee background. So there are or, or a number of those things together. And what we're seeing, particularly in discrimination law, is leaps and bounds in workplace sexual harassment, which is and gender discrimination, which is fantastic. However, there is a ginormous disparity between the rights of women in the space of gender equality and workplace sexual harassment compared to the rights that others have in terms of other discriminations. So as an example, you know, um, compensation for um, instances of workplace um, gender discrimination or workplace sexual harassment the awards in those cases, and just to put aside all of the, the cases that settle out of court, but the, the awards in those kind of cases can stretch into the hundreds of thousands, whereas the average awards issued by um, courts or tribunals for race discrimination are typically around five to $7,000. It's often not worth running those cases, especially if you then risk having to pay costs and um, uh, professor, uh, Dr. Professor uh, Chelsea Watergo in um, Queensland has recently run a discrimination um, claim that you know she's then been ordered to pay costs, of probably costs that were more than what she would have even received if if, if the discrimination had been found. So it's um, it means that um, the people don't run the cases, or they're advised by lawyers not to run the cases because the the reward versus the, the risk of running them is so great. And that really concerns me because, you know, we have these laws um, and, and we need we need the backbone um, to make sure that they're actually brought to life because otherwise what, you know, whose law is it and, and who's it's for if it's not being applied? Um, I do now want to turn to some of the really important law reform advocacy you've been doing. And, Karen's been leading a campaign to increase police accountability and to, um, I guess, impose some kind of duty of care to investigate. And Karen, I wonder if you could share with us the very powerful story of how this came to be the issue that you've been so passionate about and what you're hoping the campaign will achieve. Thanks, Larissa. Um, the, I just want to start by acknowledging the, you know, um, more than 200 years of history in this country of 
Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people attempting to hold police to account and attempting to have police treat Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and the crimes that are committed against them with the same level of diligence and care that, um, and to be kind, diligence and care, that they um, investigate and prosecute crimes against non-Aboriginal people in this country. So my campaign sits in that in that context of many, many who have gone before me and whose shoulders I get the opportunity to stand on. Um, so it's not a new campaign in, in, in that way. Um, for me, I um, was a victim, and I say victim because I don't feel like survive, uh, to say survivor, I feel like gives a, a, a bookend. And um, so I just use the, the word victim. And I think when we're talking as a lawyer, victim of crime rather than a survivor of crime, when we're talking about sexual assault, all of a sudden we're meant to have survived it and come out triumphant. Whereas actually I'm a victim of aggravated child sexual assault in both Queensland and New South Wales by a, a very well-known um, gang. And police in both states, I reported, you know, I was 14 at the time and a, f a friend of mine was also um, assaulted. and. The, I reported in my early 20s, um, back in 2004. In March next year, it'll be 20 years. And still, no justice. I've been following, I'm a lawyer, I can't get through this system. I've been following up police in two states um, for 19 and a half years. In New South Wales, they've just started um, to investigate. Um, and I can't really comment on that, but I can say that Queensland has done absolutely nothing. And when you complain about police conduct or the lack of it, um, you simply go through this process that the Uruk Justice Commission was very, um, had some very strong findings on, that when you complain about police, they simply just investigate themselves. And surprise, surprise, there's nothing to see there. It's only a tiny, tiny, tiny proportion that have a truly external-ish um, investigation of police conduct. I think it's somewhere like 5%. So the same police in the same local area command are investigating the conduct where there's allegations of corruption and other forms of malfeasance and misconduct, uh, you know, in the same local area command. And that's a system that I think is absolutely broken and the Uruk Commission has recommended that that absolutely has to change. The inquiry in Queensland into domestic and family violence and police responses has also recommended that that needs to change. And so I think now we need our political um, actors to really put in place better, better systems for police accountability. But also this concept of whose crimes get investigated. And I think to kind of bring it back to this um, this festival of crime writing um, here at the State Library this weekend, that often we don't, you know, that I actually think it's a fiction that police investigate. It's a fiction, you know, I grew up watching Law and Order and CSI and all those Murphy Brown and all those shows on TV. It's, if you look at the statistics, what types of crimes do police investigate what types of victims will they actually pursue an investigation for? Or what types of perpetrators? I know the, the Scarf brothers, um, they, they were, had an had a, um, investigation into their conduct, but the gang that was responsible for the crimes against me and my friend are a very um, white, um, you know, um, highly respected you know they're the good guys aren't they um so and you see that in the gay hate crimes um inquiry here in new south wales as well of of who of the crimes and murders and bashings of gay men in this state which is not investigated so i i really do think we need to be saying who whose law is this who are police actually protecting who are they actually caring about doing an investigation for or who are they caring about prosecuting 
And I think that that level of discretion, unfortunately, for, you know, 200, what are we up to, 230 years in, in Australia, that discretion has now, we've seen how that unfettered discretion works. It doesn't work well. And what we now need, I think, is to actually create a law to make sure that every victim of crime can expect the same treatment from police, no matter who you are, where you come from. Um, there has to be that predictability in our justice system. Otherwise, the justice system is cooked. It doesn't work. Just before we move on, if people are interested in following your campaign on this issue, how can they um, do that and get involved and support the work that you're doing? Sure, thank you. Um, there's a website called makepoliceinvestigate.org and um, it has updates on where our lobbying is up to with different attorney generals in the states and territories. Um, it has a whole heap of media clips of not just my own um, experiences over 20 years of, of trying to get police to investigate, but also the experiences of many others. Um, there's petitions, there's you can um, donate to support the legal support for other, other victims trying to you know, get through the, the police and justice system. And, um, and you can also just send an email um, to reach out if you, if you have um, a bit of spare time and would like to help out, that would be lovely. Thank you for sharing your story and thank you for your advocacy, Karen. Kirsten, what drew you to study law? The law is cooked, that's a really good title for a book. Um, sorry, I just got distracted by that. Um, what drew me to the law? Well, I am a proud Murawari Yuralari woman. I didn't always know the, the exact um, place of my custodianship. I didn't always know where I actually came from. I knew my parents were Aboriginal. I grew up as a child in the child protection system. Um, we were always just told, oh, you're from the Kamilaroi Nation, which never really got told the actual details of what that meant. And so, as a child in the child protection system, growing up disconnected largely from my Aboriginal heritage, having two parents who were pretty regularly uh, involved in the criminal justice system being locked up and um, having a pretty <laughs> dysfunctional relationship with them. Um, but I always had a very strong sense of who I was um, and I always knew that education was the pathway for me. I, I really loved school. Um, I, am, I consider myself one of the lucky ones as much as I'm one of those kids in the, who've come out of the system and not many of us do. Um, I understood very early on that education was the way to get out for me um, and I was very lucky to be in a placement with my younger sister, um, separated from my, uh, my middle sister but with my baby sister and in a family placement, not with my Aboriginal family but with my family nonetheless. And I had a long period of stability in that placement. And I think having loved education for such a long period of time and having the stability um, and seeing what was possible. I used to watch Aunty Pat O'Shane on the telly yelling at police and thinking, oh my God, who's this amazing woman? Um, 20 years later, I would interview her for my PhD and it's been amazing. But um, I actually, what drove me to law, I think is a sense of justice and fairness Growing up in that system where you think you're invisible and you're told actively you're not going to amount to anything, care kids don't do anything, you're going to be on drugs and in, in jail or on the street or having a baby, like not that any of those things are bad. Like, um, and so I think even just finishing school, I actually wanted to be a police officer um, earlier on because I actually thought the law was a, was a bridge too far for a care kid from, from Liverpool. Um, and so I had a really passionate um, teacher who spoke back to me as much as I spoke back to her probably and really just sort of um, got me to apply myself and to see what was possible and um, ended up applying for scholarships and getting into uni and actually getting into law, which I think shocked everyone, most of all myself. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just really proud that I, I realised early on that that I had to do well at school to, in order to open that door for myself. And um, I think it's because I realised that and I had the stability early on that um, I've had the many opportunities that I've had since. 
You you have worked in sort of the human rights area with the Human Rights Commission. You've done work in, t in the international sphere with human rights, worked as a researcher. I did mention that you'd done some work with the Royal Commission in the Northern Territory on the protection and detention of children, which would have echoed what you were seeing in your work around other jurisdictions. But I wonder if you could share with us some of the things that you see within the system that need changing. Yeah, so probably what I, what I forgot to mention was that having experienced the care and protection system as a child and saw it through my eyes with my parents as well in terms of contact and the interaction with the child protection systems, I then became a child protection lawyer um, and advocated and represented parents um, and became very quickly very frustrated at um, the way the system operated and, and what I could really achieve for my clients because by the time they get to you at that very pointy end, you really needed to have seen them, you know, five years ago. You need to be a social worker. And that really drove me to the policy space and the human rights space. Um, and so there are many synergies in that work that I was doing as a child protection lawyer, um, working with parents um, to the policy um, reform work and the human rights work that I've done. Um, working on two Royal Commissions has been pretty incredible. Um, I think one of the challenges with those works is they're inherently political, obviously. Um, they're dependent on the governments of the day in terms of the terms of reference you have. And often we had very long terms of references. Um, child protection was actually just tacked right on the end there of the Dondale inquiry. Um, and so, um, and I still have colleagues who've done amazing work working with young people and, um, and families in the Northern Territory who still, who are the ones who are accountable to the community about, well, what's this actually delivered for us? And so I think if you ask, or do you talk about human rights to blackfellas as I have through both the Child Protection um, Dondale Inquiry and the Disability Royal Commission, which I've, which has just finished, um, blackfellas don't really know what you're talking about. There's kind of this disconnect between human rights and these systems, these legal systems and commissions of inquiry, which purport to be about justice for everybody um, and when you're talking to mob they really don't think that that's the case um, and they're not shy about telling you that either um, but they were you know the leadership of those two commissions were you know pretty incredible um, Commissioner Mick Gorda did Don Dale obviously and um, Andrea Mason was an incredible commissioner to work with but commissions of inquiry are really limited by the legislation that sets them up, so the Royal Commission Act. We had 222 recommendations just in the Disability Royal Commission alone. Um, so I think I had a look this morning and there've been at least 10 Royal Commissions in the last, since 2014. And so Royal Commissions, I think we're Royal Commissioned out, our mob. And so when you're trying to talk about, um, you know, realising rights through these processes, um, mob don't really want to talk to you because We've been removed to the nth degree in the child protection system and we've been talked, you know, at forever about what to do and we just keep having this circularity and ritualism about royal commissions and talking about human rights but not doing human rights. And so as a First Nations woman, as important as it was to have um, blackfellas involved in those processes, and we did some really incredible and meaningful work. Like I don't need to point out that there's been no political will to implement at least the Dondale um, recommendations um, and and the communities suffer communities still suffer and I still know families who we got to um, participate in, in hearings that we ran for the disability Royal Commission and that was a Royal Commission about the violence and abuse experienced by all Australians with disability um, and we had parents who had been targeted really by child protection systems because they have a disability and had their children subsequently removed, um, who got formal apologies from the department, um, but then subsequently had their kids removed, you know, once, you know, those hearings are over and we can, you know, we can pat ourselves on the back. Those families are still actively being um, investigated and, um, you know, are under surveillance of the state. And so I think, I don't think I'll do another Royal Commission. I think two is enough. Um, but they are important mechanisms to, about, around truth telling, but they're really limited and I think um, that's pretty obvious.
Just before we move on to Tony, um, I think your advocacy is so powerful because you've really got that lived experience within the system. But I know one of the challenges of working in this space is particularly when you talk about the issues with non-Indigenous people. There's a part of them that still thinks, well, if dots are involved, there must be a reason. And I just wondered if you could share some reflections of working in this space and why it is that we say that it is really racist. You can see that with the over-representation of the number of our kids in out-of-home care that continues to increase. But you're right there at the coalface and you've seen it in action. What would be some of your reflections that continue to say that there actually is an element of racism in, in what we're seeing in those figures? Well, as we were saying before, the law is cooked. Um, there is no acknowledgement um, of the structural disadvantage that mob face and there's no attempts to really fix that. And I think, um, particularly in a child protection sense, we're used to have this provision 106A, and there have been some recent changes to that in New South Wales. But essentially, as a young practitioner, I'd be representing a mum or a dad, and 106A effectively means any child that you have that's removed can be used, uh, can be presumed that you, any subsequent children you have are in need of care. So if you have a baby and it's removed, any subsequent child you have is likely to be removed and to be deemed to be need, in need of care and protection. And that's a really high barrier to overcome. Um, and so I think because we do a lot of hand-wringing around talking about the, this wicked problem, but not a, a lot of um, action around addressing um, some of those um, systemic issues and barriers for families and talking about poverty and addressing poverty, um, providing appropriate family support to people. Um, and I had a lot of clients who, um, you know, had a dirty house and they had five kids and the dad had just gone to jail and docs are on them. They weren't trying to provide them support. It's more about the surveillance and removal and it's geared towards that legal process of removal than actually providing mum with support. And so certainly there are cases where there are legitimate um, harms that are perpetrated against children and cases to be made. but. In my observation, vast majority of them were about um, poverty and neglect, and those are the primary reasons that bring children into to the attention, families to the attention of child protection authorities. And so I think um, there's an imbalance there, and we keep talking about it like we care about it and doing inquiries. And you know, Professor Megan Davis has done some really important work about the family's culture review. Yet another commission of inquiry, which we won't implement. Um, and so I just think we're sick to death of doing these processes and nothing changing. We're not inherently bad people. Um, we've survived on this continent for a long time looking after our families and I think uh, a little bit more recognition and support around the structural disadvantage could make a real difference. Thank you. Now it could seem like a, a bit of a contrast to have two lawyers and then Tony but I think what becomes really clear is the thematics that both Karen and Kirsten have spoken about with their work come through in Tony's writing. Um, listening to Kirsten, um, I'm reminded of another really amazing book that Tony's written called The White Girl, which I'd highly recommend in terms of the lived experience under that surveillance that Kirsten talks about. But the thematic um, of um, the fact that First Nations people navigate laws by avoiding them, I think, comes through very strongly in Tony's writing. And I was going to start with some questions about women and children, but it does strike me that it might be good just to hear some of your reflections, having heard what Karen and Kirsten have to say about how you pick up those themes in your work. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, first off, it, it might seem off, off topic completely, but... Um, I do want to say something that um, post-referendum, where there's been a lot of anguish and disappointment, when people have asked me about it, I've said quite openly that something, one thing that I found uplifting and remarkable is that there is a younger generation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are doing remarkable work that we often don't hear about because they're not in that public domain of you know, so-called leaders or spokespeople. And I think the media is at great fault here, and I'm not criticising those people, but only going to a very select group of people to get an opinion. And I think what we've listened to this morning is 
further evidence of the remarkable work being done by these two women, but of course by many women and, and, and men all over Australia. And it frustrates me when I think of the dynamic work that um, is being talked about, that one is that it doesn't get a lot of airtime, because I think if people listen to what's been said this morning, they would be much more open to the fact that we can look after our own business as long as we're given the, the, the authority to do so. So I do want to say that. I think a couple other things that are really important to me that, I, that I've listened to is that, I mean, it is that, you know, what are your rights? And one thing I, I could reflect on is I've had a lot to do with lawyers when I was a younger person. I was in court all the time when I was a kid. I got into a lot of trouble and my family, yeah, I've had people in my family who were murdered and I've, I've had people in my family who have murdered other people. Um, so we have a long association with the Victoria Police. Uh, but one of the things that I, I've known inherently since I was could ever remember is that we didn't have any rights. So the, the police could do what they wanted to you. So therefore your life is about how do you negotiate around that? How do you avoid that? How do you strategize? So I knew as a five-year-old kid that you never talk to police. And I knew that, yeah, I was an altar boy and I, I knew that before I knew the Ten Commandments. Um, my mother, and my grandmother had a, a lifelong strategy of how they would deal with welfare and social workers, you know, with the threat of having your kids removed. So the horrible legacy of that of, um, yeah, my mother's 85 and she's now on a walking frame, but she still, if I went to my mother's this morning at seven o'clock, she'd be hosing the footpath, the gutter, she's already vacked the house. Yeah, everything's spotless because from the day that she was born and when we were born, my grandma would say, social worker can come through your house any time of day or night. They will look for any excuse and you can't give them that excuse. So you kept the house spotless. Um, that, yeah, we, not me, but the, our family don't mind a drink. But you get rid of all the evidence of that as, and yeah, just a social drink. So that level of surveillance and how you respond to that is a constant in, in my life. And now that I'm not affected by that, so I've worked at university for a long time and I have a, a very good job. Um, I'm still hyper surveillant. And people who don't know you from that background don't understand that. Blackfellas understand it inherently. And I think that that's the legacy that you live with. So, and it's a legacy that is difficult when you're thinking, like I've got five grown up kids and grandkids. I don't want to have to school my grandkids like that, but I'm also fearful of they will have an idealised image of what their life will be when it not won't be, it may not be that way. So those those two things to me are key. And because of that, and although this book is historical in that sense, I come from a family of extreme family violence within the family and within the wider community. And I'm not saying the Aboriginal community, I'm saying the Fitzroy community. So. I went to a Catholic school and you know, what you learn very quickly is men of any ethnic persuasion know how to give you a belt. So my Greek and Italian mates at school would come to school with the same bruises that I had. But I think that the way that I grew up is that there was no, there was nowhere to take that. Nowhere. It was, it was dealt with with such secrecy and I've written, and Larissa would know I've published on this before several women in my life, including women in my family, resorted to summary justice to f escape men. In a couple of cases, that was the, de the killing of men in their life. And in other cases, <laughs> I know I, sh I shouldn't laugh, my, my cousin attempted to poison her husband unsuccessfully several times. But luckily the judge, and this is only seven years ago, when he realised the shocking violence she'd been subject to, he he let her walk, uh, even though it was clear that she she tried. You know, anyone who's planning it, rat sack won't necessarily kill your partner. By the way, <laughs> I think people are staying away from the mushrooms too these days. But um, women and children sees Joe, who lives with his mother Marion and his sister Ruby spend his summer holidays with his grandfather Charlie while Ruby's away for the 
for that period. And during this time, his aunt Una, Marion's sister, comes to stay and Joe notices the bruises on her body. So you can see with that set up how Tony gets into the world that he's just spoken about. And I wondered if you could maybe talk about the ways in which your book shows more broadly how society fails women and children around violence, not just the legal system, but the church and society in general. What are your reflections and how do you draw this out in the story? Yeah, and it, it doesn't even get to the legal system as in courts or, or the law. And I know I'm talking historically, but I know this is a very contemporary issue, obviously, as we've just heard. It's shocking for me to hear that my younger daughters, who are 25 and 26, went to a very liberal, sort of lefty, woke high school in inner Melbourne. And they've been shocked to find out that some, not all, there's, there's some lovely young men that they were friends with from school, but some of those men, once they got into adulthood and got into a more masculine culture, have perpetrated violence against women who, and it has shocked them because it's not something they're used to or, their, or that friendship group was used to. So, but it is a historical story. It doesn't get to the um, justice system. And I think the way that I wanted to discuss this was, was firstly that the women involved in this and witness through the eyes of the children, there is no, there is no way out unless they find a way out. So Marion, who there is no violence within this family, it's a very loving family and um, both Joe and his older sister Ruby have a very loving relationship with their grandfather, which is vital. The point being though that when they seek justice, they firstly go to the parish priest because they're nominally a Catholic family and he refuses to help but simply because Una, the one who's assaulted, is not married to her partner but is living with him and he says he will not help someone who is living in sin. And I still remember these sermons from when I was an older boy, the, the um, rabid sermons against women who were risque, against women who might look to procure an abortion, coming from the priest at, at my church when I was a kid. They then approach, or Marion approaches her ex-husband, who is not a violent man himself, but he's a career criminal. He also refuses to intervene because he has a business relationship with the, the perpetrator and he doesn't want that affected. And then Marion talks to her father, Charlie, and he was a wonderful character to draw because he was a very loving, beautiful man. And Charlie, when he realises his daughter, Una, has been assaulted, he does go into a, a rage and he wants to seek vengeance against this man, but he's incapable of it because he, he can't be violent. So because of his own softness and love, he can't protect his own daughter because no one else will, no, the police aren't even, there's no sense that you would go to the police. So the only resort to those women is to take matters into their own hands. So that was really important. But I suppose the other important issue, Larissa, which is the real legacy, there is when, when Joe sees that first evidence of his aunties of the violence. But the pivotal scene in this book for me is later when Ruby, the 13 year old girl, comes and sees her auntie's body and she literally bathes her auntie and almost cleanses her auntie of this violence. And to me, that's the strongest childhood memory I have of one, and I've written about this once before, of, you know, I'd go into a milk bar and I'd see a woman in the shop and you'd see her eye made up and you'd see a little cut, a curved ring and you knew that was from a wedding ring because you'd seen that on your mum. So you'd know that person would have been assaulted and you'd be really embarrassed if she saw that you saw because it would make her feel embarrassed because you had to maintain that veil of secrecy. That, that, that was one, but for me, when people ask me how I think about violence when I was a kid, my strongest memory is of my older sister regularly having to bathe my mother's head when it, she'd have you know, quite deep cuts and she wouldn't go to the doctor to get her head stitched. So my sister would have to try and look after her. And that's my strongest memory of, of strangely, my strongest memory of childhood violence is not of the violence, it's of my older sister giving my mother the care that she needed when she couldn't get it anywhere else. I thought I might get you just to do a quick reading. I'm mindful we're running out of time, but the book's so lovely. And I thought one of the things 
mean, it's powerful, it's sad, it's heartbreaking, but there's strength and love in there as well. You really explore the silences around violence, the fact that people see those scars or the covering up and there's sort of a understanding that you don't talk about it. And I thought we might get you to just do a quick reading to give everyone a bit of a taste of the power of the book and then just see if yeah. Kirsten and Karen have any comments and then we'll see if we've got room for a question. Yeah, I'll only do a page and a half, so there should be time. The evening Una knocked at her sister's front door. Her face was heavily made up with foundation, rouge and eyeliner. Regardless, she couldn't mask the shadow of a deep bruise under her right eye. Marion hadn't missed the damage and opened her mouth, about to speak before checking herself. She knew instinctively that, initially at least, she'd have to go along with Una's charade. Experience had taught Marion that when dealing with troubled women in the family, at work or on the street, silence was a necessity and accusations, even anger directed against the man responsible for a broken face, could be fatal if the truth was ever discovered. A single word in the wrong place could be received as a statement of failure. Patience for loved ones, often seething with anger or gripped by sadness for the victims of violence, was an inherited skill. This is unexpected love, Marion said as casually as she could manage, walking ahead of her sister along the hallway. Is there something up with you? Nothing really, Una replied, her voice evaporating as she spoke. I felt like a walk and thought I'd come for a cup of tea. Una was in no doubt that her older sister had seen through her disguise. Her only wish at that moment was that Marion would not force her to speak the words that would break her spirit even more. Joe looked up from his dinner plate at Una and smiled. He was always happy to see her. Hello, beautiful, Una said. Hello, Una, Joe said, seemingly, seemingly oblivious to the bruises on her face. Are you hungry? Marion asked her sister. Let me fetch you a plate. Una cradled her stomach as if she was about to be sick. I'm not hungry, just a cup of tea would be nice. She appeared unsteady on her feet. Please sit down, Marion said. She wrung her hands, anxious about what she should say. She would need to find a way to raise the issue of Una's bruised face, but couldn't do so while her son was in the room. Thank you. Um, yeah, give me my book back. <laughs> this book. Um, I just want to see, Kirsten, did you have any reflections after what Tony said? And then I'll ask you, Karen. Uh, as, you, as you sort of reflected, Larissa, there's, the, um, kind of the, there's, a lot, there's a lot in there around the, um, the, viol the illusions of violence and then the, the strength and care at the family level, but the silence as well. And I can only really talk about this through the lens of experience, which I've had recently. And um, there's a lot talked about First Nations people and violence, but and we're demonised in that light and a lot of that's probably not not um, accurate. But I recently lost my sister due to complications to domestic violence, my baby sister that I grew up with. And um, listening to that, I just hear the way our family knew different parts of um, what was happening to her as her sister, her elder sister. I didn't really hear about it until she was hospitalised. And so um, just seeing the, the photos of what, um, had happened to her and just the enormity of violence that was um, heaped upon her and the care that and holding her while she's in hospital um, but also the, the failures of systems that exist around our people as well um, and I just think it's such an incredibly complex um, issue um, and yeah there's a lot that families um, have to, have to do um, have to deal with in the way that they try to not aggravate the situation and also try to protect their family members um, but also uh, with the silence I think my sister might have found incredibly hard as well even though she she constructed different narratives in what she would tell us um, we would all get together after the fact and try and reconstruct what was going on with her and so I just think um, I'm really excited to read the full book um, Tony but it's, um, it's it's a very very um Important, important story. Okay. Um, thank you for for sharing. Um, a lot of a lot of emotion, um, and it, to me, I think that sometimes the positioning of violence against First Nation women in this in our country and globally is that it's a 
problem that is within communities and it's a First Nations issue and First Nations people must sort it out themselves. Whereas the majority of violence experienced by First Nations women are not perpetrated by First Nations men. It's perpetrated by non-Indigenous men. And I think that sometimes gets lost. And the, the feeling of trapped and hopelessness I've had in my own life of this, and this conundrum of, you know, um, hearing and knowing that, that this legal system, this police system, the justice system has never been there for, for so for, for actually the majority of Australians, <laughs> um, but particularly not for First Nations um, women, children and men. And, you know, so on the one hand, it's this thing of going, you, you know that the cops are not going to do anything. You know that the services aren't going to do anything. But where else do you go? Like, are you meant to just sit there in silence and put up with this stuff? There. Or do you, you know, I only watched The Godfather, I think I've told Larissa this before, I've, I only watched The Godfather like 12 months ago for the first time ever. And the first scene is this father coming to The Godfather and saying, my daughter was raped, the police and the courts have, have let us down, so Godfather, can you please go take matters into your own hands? That's the opening scene. It's like this story is as old as the hills of who is this justice system for? And, you know, you, as a solicitor, as a lawyer, I've got to believe in the justice system being capable of reforming itself. But man, that's hard. And, and, um, and at the end, I just want to play back one of the other influences in my life was Tracy Chapman growing up. And I, I'm not going to do I might Google the words while um, Tony. Um, I thought you were going to sing. Um, I am going to try to. Where's, I'm a very bad where's Nadi Simpson when you need her? Um, just, I, what, I think I want to add something, and I, I, I thank you again for, for the words of, from both of you. There are issues here that are really relevant for me. Is that in this novel, by the way, the perpetrator is a, is a non Aboriginal man, but um, it's a, there is a real difficulty. So, then my personal story, the perpetrator of violence in our family is my father who's an Aboriginal man and therefore the complexity of this is that we're a family who never would be secretive about this. Thankfully my mother refuses to be, to be silenced but I understand also that you're dealing with a legacy and, a, and attacks on First Nations people where those stereotypes of negativity can be reinforced just by what you're talking about. So I'm always constantly aware of that. One of the things I've learned throughout my adult life is that, so prior to where I am now, I was at um, Victoria University for five years in the Mundani Balak Academic Centre, led by an amazing Yorta Yorta friend of mine, Karen Jackson. And what I've always found, if I'm in a discussion with a group of Aboriginal people, and that discussion is led by Aboriginal women, there's a great sense of safety in that discussion. There's a great sense of openness and honesty in that discussion. So when we gather around and we talk about you know, what's happened in our family life and the you know, stories that are similarly terrible in relationship to my upbringing, you can have stories that empower you by sharing them. Once you go outside that space to either a mainstream situation, or, and I'll be honest, sometimes just if you're with Aboriginal men, you don't feel safe and the, the, sh the discussion shifts. So one of the things I've learned from life experience is that, you know, if we're talking about how we're going to stop these, these issues or how we're going to make sure we get legal um, justice, we have to have Aboriginal women at the forefront of those discussions. Not, not, and I, I don't think equally. I think they've got to run the show. They've got to run the show because that's the, that's the only time I ever feel totally safe to have those discussions. Except if I'm in a room full of strangers I've never met before. <laughs> Karen? Okay, so this is Behind the Wall by Tracy Chapman. Now, I'm a terrible singer, but on <laughs> national radio, I'm going to do this. Excellent. Last night I heard the screaming, loud voices behind the wall. Another sleepless night for me. 
It won't do no good to call the police. Always come late if they come at all. And when they arrive, they say they can't interfere with domestic affairs between a man and his wife. And they walk out the door, the tears well up in her eyes. Last night I heard the screaming, then a silence that chilled my soul. I prayed that I was dreaming when I saw the ambulance in the road. And the policeman said, I'm here to keep the peace. Will the crowd disperse? I think we could all use some sleep. Amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, now, I have to apologise that there's no room left for questions, but I think you can agree that it's been an extraordinary privilege to hear these voices that do not get enough space. And there was extreme generosity in the way that Karen, Kirsten and Tony have, have shared they're very, very personal and quite traumatic stories with us today. It would have been inappropriate to truncate that. And um, I'm glad that we had room for it and very grateful for what we've learnt from listening. So please join me in thanking Karen, Kirsten and Tony. If you, do have, if you do have questions, as you can see, they're three very generous people, so I'm sure they won't mind if you ask something now. And just a reminder that I will be doing a one-on-one -on -one with Tony about his book at two o'clock back here if you want to have um, more of a deep dive into this extraordinary book. And just finally, uh, lots of Tony's books are available. He will be signing, so you can get on top of your Christmas list and uh, knock a few presents off if you like, as well as get some treasures for yourself. Thank you so much.